Hello, I'm Ben Warren uh, from the NNHN uh, and the subject I'm covering with you is insect distributions and biogeography in the Western Indian Ocean Islands. Uh, the biogeography of insects and other taxa from this region is a topic I've been closely involved in for a number of years. However, I'm aware that to some people this subject may sound uh, initially a bit obscure. Uh, and therefore, I've divided this session into three parts. First of all, why we're interested uh, in this topic of insects on islands, uh, a whole community of researchers, including myself. Uh, secondly, I'm detailing to you the main methods uh, we use. And the third part is a case study uh, where I go into detail on biogeographic data for the Western Indian Ocean uh, and how it informs us about the role of environmental changes uh, in generating the biological diversity, that is to say large numbers of unique species uh, that we see there today. So to begin with this first part, if we want to understand the role of environmental changes uh, in the origins of diversity, first of all, why use islands? And secondly, why study insects? So confronting the, this first question here, you may have heard people saying that islands are like natural laboratories uh, for studying ecology and evolution, which is a nice term, but it's not always clear to people why uh, we consider them to be uh, natural laboratories. Surely you might say uh, we have natural places much closer to home, like the forest of Fontainebleau. Uh, can't we consider uh, this forest to be a natural laboratory? Well, of course we can, uh, and we may also argue that the forest is a bit like an island. But the point I want to make here is that oceanic islands uh, have a number of advantages over continental regions uh, for understanding origins of diversity. Well, this first point is really obvious, that islands are geographically discrete and isolated. <laughs> well, of course you're going to say they're islands, uh, but what's often less obvious is that because of this, uh, their coastlines often present long-standing limits to the distributions of species and populations. Uh, and there's many examples that I could have chosen here, so I could have chosen one in from plants or from vertebrates, but I've chosen a, an insect example, in fact a European insect example. Uh, a good one is presented by the beetle Agabus arcticus, uh, where today it's only found in extreme northern Europe uh, and the Arctic region. But we know from sediment records that it existed in the past in the Massif Central of France uh, until 13,000 years ago. Um, and this from an evolutionary perspective is very, very recently. So what we can infer from this is that it's undergone an extremely rapid shift in distribution in a very short period of time. And this situation really contrasts with the one that we very often see on oceanic islands. Um, and I've picked here the volcanic island of La Palma, in the Canary Islands, um, and again a beetle example. So based on the phylogeography uh, of the beetle uh, Tarfius quadratus, we can infer that this species has been confined to the tiny volcanic island of La Palma for around 2.7 million years. Um, so my message here is not that island species are older, indeed Agabus arcticus may be the same age as Tarfius quadratus, but rather that they, these island species have generally moved much less. Um, our Tarfius beetle here has been confined to a small geographic region uh, for around 200 times as long as our continental species. Okay, a second reason why study islands is that islands have often, uh, though not always, arisen what I call de novo. That is to say that they've arisen from the sea devoid of life, uh, rather than being fragments of existing land masses. Uh, and the result is that their ages, that is to say, the time available for species to colonize them, is often well known. And perhaps the most perfect uh, example here is the Hawaiian archipelago, 
where the prevailing view is that their origin is due to plate movement uh, over a volcanic hotspot uh, that's given rise to a, a time progressive series uh, of islands and seamounts from the youngest island which is the volcanically active island of the big island of Hawaii uh, and then you have a age progressive time series of islands uh, back to the oldest island that still exists which is Nihau around five million years ago and indeed also to what we call seamounts that's to say uh, what were once islands that are now uh, submerged below the sea that go back in time much further still. And so what we effectively see here when we study the biology of these islands uh, is evolution on a conveyor belt. Uh, uh, a, a conveyor belt, c'est-à-dire un tapis roulant en français, uh, in which we know at what time each species was added to the belt, donc à quel moment chaque espèce a été uh, mise sur le tapis. Um, so we have uh, a natural uh, time series. And another point regarding why islands is that islands are also often replicated, by which I simply mean that we get numerous islands in an archipelago. So each one is more or less equivalent, and we can consider them as replicates. Uh, one example that uses this point, uh, combined with the one in the previous slide, is the calibration of rates at which genes evolve. Um, and here a good example comes from Hawaiian fruit flies, Drosophila, uh, in which each island has a unique species. So we see here the phylogeny that I covered in part two uh, for each species here. So you see that each island Drosophila is divergent. Um, and we're seeing here its divergence in our chosen gene, YP1. Um, and we also know here the maximum age of each island. Uh, and this means that we have numerous replicates with which to plot a graph. So on the y-axis here we have the divergence in our chosen, chosen gene, YP1. Uh, and on the x-axis we have the age of each island. So in fact the maximum time that's been available for the divergence that we observe. And so we can plot a line through the points, and evidently the slope of this line uh, gives us the rate at which YP1 evolves. Okay, so in summary, as a result of a handful of basic features, oceanic islands are often used as model systems, that is to say natural tools, if you like, for understanding the origins of diversity in the world in general, that is to say, even though we're studying islands, uh, the implications of what we find go far beyond islands. They uh, implicate evolution, evolution and ecology in the world in general, uh, and also in the context of global change. So as a reminder of the key features in response to why, my why islands question, uh, it's that they're geographically discrete, that they're isolated, that they often have de novo origins, that is to say they form devoid of life and can be considered in English, we use a term clean slates, c'est-à-dire des ardoises vierges, uh, for understanding the origins of diversity. And also that multiple islands can often serve as eco-evolutionary replicates. So I'm now going to consider the advantages of insects. Uh, in this context, that is to say, if you're going to choose islands, why also study insects? Well, one basic point here is that we may observe differences in diversity that we seek to explain. So, as a hypothetical example, we may have genus A with 100 species and genus B with just one species. Some difference in environmental history may explain the difference in diversity that we observe between these two genera of interest. Well, in order to study such situations, we ideally need cases in which uh, groups are confined to a study area uh, and differ in diversity within that area. And secondly, we also need at least one group we need that at least one group can, can be considered to have high diversity within the study area. So it may sound obvious, all this, 
but it's not always the case. So amphibians are certainly nice organisms to study, but they generally don't arrive naturally on oceanic islands. And so we're left comparing zero species with zero species. Birds, which are actually my principal study group, uh, are somewhat better, but still uh, somewhat better in this regard, but they generally, generally each oceanic island colonization only gives rise to uh, just one species. And therefore, we're still in a situation in this context here of comparing one species with one species. And this is where uh, insects really are an exceptional taxon. Because firstly, different groups of insects have speciated at uh, very different scales. So for example, uh, on arrival in the Hawaiian Islands, some insect groups have undergone only one speciation event. So uh, the moths Rhynchopestria is a good example where there's only one species in the Hawaiian Islands. Other insect groups have undergone an enormous number of speciation events. Uh, and there exist many examples of this. One nice one would be the beetles of New Guinea, uh, where one single species arrived uh, at some time in the past and gave rise to 150 species that we observe there in the present day. Um, but the world record here goes to Hawaiian Drosophila. Um, where just one species arrived in the Hawaiian Islands uh, and has simply exploded uh, in a speciation sense. So it's given rise to a thousand species uh, that we see there in the present day. Another point that's similar to the one I've just made is that insects are among the organisms with the highest colonization capacities in the world. That is to say, to the extent that islands are old enough for organisms to colonize them. And what I have in mind here is that some volcanic islands, when they're just forming, uh, there's a lot of volcanism going on, they're still hot. For a few years, uh, no organisms may be able to colonize at all. But it's not long, in fact, surprisingly little time, just a few years, uh, after which organisms can colonize. And it's fair to say that in this sense, all oceanic islands uh, have insects. And indeed, uh, insects have reached the most remote islands in the world. Uh, so this genus Rhynchogonus, uh, we the Rhynchogonus weevils is a good example, where they've reached very remote islands out in the Pacific, so the Hawaiian Islands uh, and also Christmas Island, for example. Many organisms don't naturally reach such islands. Uh, so ex Hawaii is a good example where it's right out in the Pacific and therefore we do not have any native non-flying mammals. We, do also, we also do not have any native amphibians. And this is not unique to Hawaii. It's also true for the Mascarene Archipelago that I'll be covering in part three on the Indian Ocean, that we also in this archipelago have no native non-flying mammals, no native amphibians. And so my point here is that insects are really in no risk of falling in this category. Having highlighted the amazing dispersal capacity of insects, we should note that this is also true for some other groups like mosses. Um, the spores of mosses are transported high up in the jet stream uh, and they also reach remote islands. But once they do so, their spores usually continue to be dispersed. The result is that it's relatively rare that the island population of a, that the island population of a moss is so isolated from those elsewhere that it diverges uh, to form a unique species. Um, and this is much less the case for insects. So having reached some of the remote, most remote islands in the world, they often don't disperse further. And so they diverge from the source population, being it on a continent or on a neighboring island. And Rhynchogonus actually remains a very good example, where having arrived in the remote islands of the mid-Pacific, the Society Islands, uh, we find that uh, Rhynchogonus populations have diverged to form what we call endemic species. That is to say those found nowhere else on Earth. 
Uh, and that's the case even though these two islands are very close. They're only, as you can see here, just a few kilometers apart. So to summarize this part, when using islands as model systems to understand the origins of diversity, insects are an unusually useful group because of a wide range of dispersal capacities uh, and their ability to speciate at very small spatial scales as well as much larger ones. And here, as in later sections, I point you to some background literature uh, that develops the topics covered in this section. It allows you to dig deeper in particular areas of interest. Uh, I'm now going to leave you to read the methods section. For those of you studying phylogenetics, uh, you may find that these methods are already familiar to you and you can skim certain sections. Uh, for others, with a background in ecology or other areas of biology, uh, you may find that all the details are needed. Uh, and then I'll come back to you for part three of this session uh, with another video. Okay, bye for now.